very welcome indeed. I particularly want to welcome the Governor of the Central Bank, uh, Professor Lane. Uh, he was, as we know, appointed uh, Governor in November of last year. And uh, he is currently on leave from his position in Trinity College, where he's a Whiteley Professor of uh, Political Economy, a chair that, of course, uh, has had many distinguished predecessors, such as uh, Dermot McAleese, our, our dear friend and, and colleague. Uh, the, the governor began lecturing there in 1997. He has a PhD in economics, which is uh, from Harvard. He was assistant professor uh, of economics and international affairs at Columbia between 95 and 97. And he has uh, served, of course, in uh, very many important capacities in the European uh, system, including the uh, advisory scientific committee of the Systemic Risk Board. Um, his uh, interests, his particular academic interests, are financial globalization, European monetary integration, macroeconomic policy design, and the macroeconomics of exchange rates and capital flows. He has, um, <clears throat> he has set us a new protocol today, which he commented on himself earlier. And that normally speaking, uh, the Institute sort of closes down during the month of August in best European style. Uh, but this was uh, too great an opportunity for us to pass up, so we decided to host it today with great delight and uh, much enthusiasm. And uh, the astonishing thing is that there's so many people here in a sense that this is one of the biggest audience with audiences we have ever had for any speaker. So I think we'll probably keep the doors open next year during the whole of August <laughs> in anticipation of uh, being inundated with great numbers of people. In a certain sense, uh, the governor has indicated that uh, in an academic style that today is a sort of end of term uh, review. There have been three major publications with the Irish uh, economy, uh, which he will mention, and uh, that has given him the framework in which to offer certain views. He's going to provide uh, uh, an overview of the macro financial challenges facing the country. He'll discuss our macroeconomic prospects. Uh, and of course, he's going to have a look at the implications of Brexit for the economy as a whole and for the financial system in particular. So it gives me great pleasure indeed to invite Governor Lane to address you. So, of course, uh, having this uh, timing in August uh, is maybe practice for next year, which will be the 10-year anniversary of the start of the global crisis. Uh, so I'm sure you've got your plans for the 7th of August uh, 26, uh, 2017. So it's a pleasure to address the members of the IIEA today. Uh, as Brendan said, it's timely to uh, provide a mid-year assessment of the macro-financial environment facing Ireland, especially in the aftermath of the Brexit referendum. In addition, uh, over the last few weeks, there's been uh, numerous publications by the Central Bank itself, the International Monetary Fund, the European Banking Authority, and the uh, Central Statistics Office. Uh, and all of these publications are relevant in uh, performing a considered view of the current uh, economic and financial uh, uh, challenges facing Ireland. So today, uh, what I'm going to do is, first of all, I'll look at the, provide a brief overview of the Irish and European macro environment. Second, I'll outline some lessons from the IMF's Article 4 and Financial Sector Stability Assessment Reports, which came out a few days ago. Third, I will discuss the recent uh, bank stress exercises. Fourth, I'll look at Brexit, both from a macro perspective and in relation to Ireland's role as a financial centre. And finally, I will conclude by looking at the measurement issues in assessing the Irish macro financial environment. So turning first to the uh, macroeconomic uh, data, uh, in relation to the broad euro area macroeconomic environment, environment, the latest ECB Governing Council Monetary Policy Meeting on July 21 assessed that the euro area economic recovery is expected to continue at a moderate pace. So it's happening if only at a moderate pace, uh, and in, in turn it's supported by accommodative uh, monetary and financial conditions. 
That said, given prevailing uncertainties, the Governing Council will continue to monitor economic and financial market developments. And over the coming months, we concluded at the last meeting uh, that when we have more information, including new staff projections, we'll, we will be in a better position to assess the underlying macro conditions, the most likely paths for inflation and growth, and the distribution of risks around these paths. And uh, as you well understood, uh, understand by now, if warranted to achieve its objective, the Governing Council will act by using all the instruments available within its mandate. Now, turning to the Irish economy, it is possible to filter the noisy headline data, which I'll return to later in the speech, to identify a range of domestically focused aggregate variables, such as employment, consumer spending, uh, and a suitably adjusted measure of investment, to indicate that the Irish economy is performing well. Although living standards and the level of employment remain below pre-crisis levels, much of the ground lost during the crisis has been recovered over the last three years. Now, even allowing for a material uh, adjustment for the negative impact of Brexit, which again I'll come back to later in this speech, the bank's latest quarterly bulletin, which came out last week, still conditionally projects uh, fairly decent growth rates of 4.9% uh, this year and 3.6% next year. Uh, with the key unemployment indicator falling to 7.2% next year. Now, at the same time, the legacy of high public and private sector debts and the sensitivity of small, highly open economies to international shocks mean that there remain considerable downside risks to this central scenario. And again, the Article 4 report of the IMF, which came out a few days ago, provides a valuable independent risk assessment together with a range of recommendations to mitigate those downside risks and also to support a robust and inclusive medium-term growth strategy. The IMF also uh, published its uh, financial sector uh, assessment report for Ireland. In turn, this is based on a comprehensive financial sector assessment program, or FSAP, uh, which is an in-depth exercise to assess the resilience of the financial sector, the quality of the regulatory and supervisory framework, and the capacity to manage and resolve financial crises. The FSAP exercise started in September 2015 and included a extensive engagement with the Central Bank, between the IMF and the Central Bank, the Department of Finance, the European Central Bank, and a whole range of other stakeholders in the financial system, both here and overseas. To give you a sense of the scale and scope of this exercise, the third and final mission visit in March involved 10 IMF staff on the ground in Dublin, more than 130 meetings in Dublin, Frankfurt, and London, and the submission of over 300 documents, many of which were hundreds of pages long. So this is a, a big independent uh, assessment of our financial uh, sector and our regulatory environment. And the conclusion of this uh, project and the publication last week of the assessment report is an important milestone, since it's the first such review since the crisis and provides a timely assessment of our progress against international standards and best practice. In addition, of course, it represents a further marker of the renormalization of Ireland's relationship with the IMF. Now, the Central Bank welcomes the pos broadly positive assessment, which reflects the efforts of the Irish authorities in recent years to address the weaknesses in structural, regulatory, and supervisory arrangements uh, that existed prior to the crisis. The assessment of report recognizes the significant strengthening of the financial system, the major structural changes that have taken place in recent years, and the implementation of a more proactive regulatory approach. Uh, with one of the conclusions being that the authorities have been effective and vigorous in strengthening prudential regulation and supervision, implementing the lessons of the crisis, and keeping up with developments in European and in international good practice. In relation to the supervision of securities markets, the assessment report also acknowledges the bank's leading role in the analysis of collective investment activities, which is significant in view of the large scale and international interconnectedness of the Irish investment funds sector. Now, at the same time, the IMF has also made a number of important recommendations to increase further the resilience of the Irish financial sector and improve the effectiveness of the central bank as a regulator. We've already started to work on these recommendations in conjunction with the other Irish authorities and our European counterparts. For example, to take uh, one issue, uh, the bank has recently formed a new internal advisory committee 
on the design of domestic macroprudential policy measures, including the borrower-based mortgage rules, the countercyclical capital buffer, and the uh, famous OC buffer, which we all know means the other systemically important significant institution buffer. So in line with the IMF's recommendation to improve, improve further the degree of public transparency in relation to our decision-making processes, and in line with our own ongoing commitment to provide evidence-based explanations for our policy measures, summary records of the meeting, meetings of this new Macroprudential Measures Committee, the MMC, will be published in due course. Another element of the FSAP uh, project was a stress test exercise for the banking system. The forward-looking assessment of the resilience of banks to various risk scenari scenarios is a key tool in informing supervisory actions and financial stability policies. In fact, the bank has recently participated in three such exercises. First, the, uh, as part of the IMF FSAP. Second, as part of the wider bank stress test across the European Union, led by the European Banking Authority, and the results uh, I read came out late Friday night. And third, the single supervisory mechanism stress tests, which followed the EB methodology, EBA methodology and ran concurrently with it. In addition, the bank also uh, continues to review and challenge the bank's own stress testing approaches and outcomes. So let me focus on the uh, FSAP and EBA uh, exercises since these outcomes are now in the public domain. So the IMF uh, FSAP bank stress test uh, was supported by the bank's own analytical framework. Again, uh, these adver adverse scenarios and stress tests are not predictive but uh, the FSAP one, for example, was designed to assess the capacity of Irish banks to withstand a severe but plausible scenario of a simultaneous downturn in the Irish and UK economies, characterised by a fall in property prices and a widening of sovereign spreads that in turn triggers increased funding costs for banks. And the exercise confirmed that the risks within the banking sector are manageable at a system-wide level. Now, it's not surprisingly, it also highlighted that some, highlighted that some vulnerabilities uh, still exist as a consequence of the recent crisis. Turning to the EBA stress tests, the, this is really a useful barometer to assess the health of the European banking sector and uh, to focus on the largest banks operating in the European Union, including uh, AIB and Bank of Ireland here. Now, relative to other member countries, the Irish banking system has experienced higher loan loss rates since 2008, we know this. Since projected credit losses in the adverse scenario of any stress test are calculated based on past experience, the capital depletion in the adverse scenario is inevitably more pronounced for Irish institutions. Stronger starting capital positions, coupled with ongoing balance sheet repair, has enabled European banks including the Irish banks, to withstand a more severe scenario in this year's stress test compared to the specification of the 2014 stress test. As with the FSAP stress test results, the primary message from the exercise is the, that the Irish banks, in, included in the EBA sample, AIB and Bank of Ireland, are adequately capitalised, but remain vulnerable to a downturn, especially in relation to the continued work out of problem loans and the sustain sustainability under stress of current profitability levels. So if you take the FSAP, the EBA, and the SSM stress test results, together with additional stress testing work uh, by our supervisory uh, uh, staff, uh, these are being combined with a full risk assessment for all in-scope banks to feed into the annual supervisory review and evaluation process, the so-called SHREP which is used to determine capital requirements and capital guidance for banks. In addition, the stress tests and SHREP inform the risk mitigation programs, uh, which are focused on driving the banks to continue to re reduce their risk profiles. As the ECB is now the competent authority for the supervision of Irish banks, the focus of our joint work includes ensuring that banks make further progress in the workout of problem loans, have credible business strategies, and risk management pl plans in place to increase resilience to deterioration in their operating environment, including any adverse consequences of Brexit. So on Brexit, uh, the short and medium-term macroeconomic effects on Ireland of Brexit depend on several factors. Most directly, a slowdown in UK output growth and a depreciation of sterling against the euro 
adversely affect UK oriented Irish exporters. And these factors, these two factors, UK output and uh, the bilateral exchange rate, uh, explain why we have materially revised our growth forecast for 2016 and 2017. While the Irish economy has become less reliant on the UK for trade over recent decades, the UK remains an important market for many indigenous firms, with the agri-food and tourism sectors especially exposed. Now, at the same time, it is important uh, to put the recent depreciation of sterling against the euro into context, since it can also be interpreted as the unwinding of the bilateral appreciation that began in summer 2014. So the current uh, rate uh, of 80.84 uh, uh, is very close to the average rate between the start of 2009 and summer 2014 of 0.85. So where we are now is basically where we were for most of the time, 2009 to 2014. And what's happened then is just basically an appreciation followed by a depreciation of sterling. So uh, it's important to uh, put into that context. Now, at the same time, the uh, sterling euro rate remains a lot weaker compared to pre-crisis patterns. Recall that the average uh, pound uh, euro rate between the onset of the euro in 99 and summer 07 pre-crisis was at 67.67. So, you know, the analytical framework of where we are now has a post-crisis benchmark and a pre-crisis benchmark, and how we think about the impact of the exchange rate uh, depends on that history. Despite some initial fears, we have yet to see the operation of more powerful transmission mechanisms by which Brexit triggers a more general international decline in conference indicators and or initiates a risk-off phase in the international financial system that would involve a general repricing of risk premia a decline in asset values and a tightening in financial conditions. Rather, so far, the international markets have focused on the likelihood of a prolongation of low policy rates with a visible drop in the yields of many, in many sovereign bond markets and a related reduction in bank equity values. So while financial contagion channels have not yet been strongly operative, the gradual crystallization of, of the prospective new relationship between the UK and EU in the coming months carries the continuous risk of triggering adverse market developments if a harder form of Brexit emerges as the more likely final outcome. Moreover, in view of the tight economic and financial links uh, to the UK and the high levels of private and public sector debt, Ireland is especially vulnerable to any Brexit-related reversal in international financial sentiment. Now, uh, there's also an active debate about the implications of Brexit for the configuration of the European financial sector. The impact on the geographical producers, choices of producers of financial services depends on a wide array of factors, including the accumulated track records as financial centres, the nature of national legal and tax systems, the relative level of operating costs, uh, transport links, and the relative attractiveness of different cities to the families of internationally mobile financial workers. Since the EU has a harmonised approach to financial regulation, regulatory competition among member states should not be a driving factor in determining locational choices within the EU. This uh, applies uh, especially to the euro area since the ECB-led single supervisory mechanism provides a unified institutional framework for the supervision of banks. Accordingly, the bank's approach to authorising and regulating financial firms is firmly embedded in the wider European system of financial supervision. In particular, the bank has a well-established approach to authorizations in line with the practice of our continental peers. We implement our mission statement of safeguarding stability, protecting consumers, by ensuring that the applicant complies with all relevant EU and national legislative and prudential requirements. These requirements protect consumers of financial services from the potential effects of fraud or failure, and assure the various types of funders of financial entities that corporate governance safeguards are robust. In addition, the stability of the domestic and international financial systems is a key focus for the bank and international regulators, with well-designed recovery and resolution plans for financial firms, especially systemically important institutions, an important element in limiting contagion and protecting taxpayers in the event a firm uh, goes bust. So the bank is committed to providing a clear, consistent, open and transparent authorization process while ensuring, while ensuring a rigorous assessment of the applicable regulatory standards. 
The authorization gateway forms an important part of our supervisory model based on assertive risk-based supervision in line with international standard, standards and underpinned by the credible threat of enforcement. To ensure transparent and predictable authorization timelines for high volume processes, the bank publishes on a semi-annual basis its service standards in respect to processing authorizations. Uh, coincidentally, the latest report in this series will be published later today, so you have an uh, evening reading ahead of you. In relation to unique and complex applications, the authorization process is inevitably more layered compared to routine cases, requiring a substantial commitment of resources and the assembly of dedicated project teams with the requisite skills and internal governance processes. To deliver an efficient and robust re regulatory regime, the bank has expanded its target staffing levels in recent years, subject to the capacity to recruit and retain those with the required skills and experience. Since the establishment of the single supervisory mechanism, the ECB, with input from the relevant national co competent authority, uh, the central bank in Ireland, is the competent authority for granting banking licenses. So the assessment criteria at SSM level are detailed, rigorously applied, and uh, unaltered by Brexit. Equally, the SSM is directly responsible for the supervision of significant institutions, with Frankfurt-based personnel leading the joint supervisory teams overseeing each individual institution, such that banks can locate anywhere in the EU area and receive the same supervisory treatment. And this is a, a fundamental principle of a banking union. Uh, banks can go anywhere and uh, have the same supervisory regime within the euro area. Now, let me turn uh, finally to the challenges involved in measuring macrofinancial developments in Ireland. For the conduct of monetary and macroprudential <laughs> policies, it is essential that there exist robust measures of the levels of domestic incomes and production, together with reliable ancillary measures of sectoral and international financial accounts. More generally, such indicators are also vital for fiscal analysis and many private sector decisions. The highly globalized nature of the Irish macrofinancial system means that accurate implementation of UN or Eurostat uh, manuals does not, does not provide sufficient guidance, as is evident from the debate following the most recent CSO releases. Over time, it is desirable that international conventions in the measurement of flows and stocks of economic and financial variables are redesigned in order to avoid anomalous national uh, statistical outcomes and provide sufficient granularity that the different domestic and external users of national statistics can be accommodated. In the near term, in relation to measurement, there are two domestic challenges. First, I welcome the initiative by the CSO to establish a consultative group, which I will chair, that will consider inter alia the potential for the development of super supplementary statistical series that may un un enhance understanding of the Irish economy and financial system. In recent years, the CSO has published a series of high quality explanatory notes about the impact of multinational firms on the national accounts. It is timely to build on this work in order to construct useful alternative indicators on an ongoing basis. Second, policymakers should take care to look through the headline data in order to develop and communicate alternative policy targets that are not affected by the various statistical issues that have been much discussed in recent weeks. So let me conclude. I've covered a, a wide range of topics. Still, it's possible to identify some common threads that underpin the analysis. First, we should recognize that the baseline case remains quite positive, with considerable momentum supporting a broadly based recovery. Second, at the same time, it is obvious that much remains to be accomplished in addressing the adverse legacy effects of the crisis and establishing the foundations for sustainable and inclusive medium-term growth. Third, Ireland continues to be especially vulnerable to downside shocks, such that policies to improve the resilience of the private and public sectors are vital. Accordingly, the management of the macro-financial implications of Brexit should be un underpinned by due consideration of these three factors. For the central bank, the issues identified in my speech today imply a busy ongoing work program in order to fulfill our mandate. I look forward to leading our efforts in the coming months after a short holiday uh, uh, later this week. So uh, let, let me stop there. Thank, Thank you. you.